So we're going to get to the point where you'll see something of this form and you'll say, great, I know exactly what that is, but I want you to reason through what's going on. Okay? Now, we're going to do another just like this, but unlike uh, this first example, um, when we have a go at these, you can see I haven't given you quite so neat a pair of points, right? Now, I'm going to think about what equation would I write that would give me the perpendicular bisector of these two points. Here's my start for you. There's going to be two moduli that are equal to each other. How will I write it? And you want to make the distance to here and the distance to here. Does someone want to try the left-hand side for me? What should I put in there? How do I algebraically say the distance from my complex number z that can move around and negative i? Hmm. Interesting. How do we do it the first time? I've got a couple examples here, right? Like here, this is my way of saying the distance between z and that spot there, negative 1. So if I want the distance between z and this spot, negative i, how would I write that? Yeah, it'll be z plus i because what I'm doing is z take away negative i. That's, that's how I find the distance between two things. So those double negatives are going to cancel. That gives me this. Okay? In much the same way that the double negatives here cancel to give me z plus 1, but this is a different set of points. Okay? Uh, what about no, this guy? There's going to be another z take away here. It's going to be z take away this. Um, normally we would just like expand that out, so it'd be z take away 3 take away i. Um, I suppose you could also write that in this form. Both of those would be equivalent, wouldn't they? Okay? Now the tricky thing about this, um, you've probably, I hope, already got those two points on your R-gain diagram, and you can go ahead right now and just, like you've got a ruler, you can draw the perpendicular bisector in. I'd love you to go and do that. However, in this case, because the points aren't so nice, uh, you can't just read off the equation. At least I can't. I can't look at it and say, oh, I know exactly where that goes, even when you're on a grid. So for that reason, we need to think a little harder about how we can find this Cartesian equation. So I'm going to pause for a minute, let you have a think about how you would go about that while I make some, myself some more space, um, and then we're going to try and tackle this together with a technique we haven't done from Tuesday. Let's have a think about this together, and as I sort of wandered around a little bit, I saw some people making some starts and others just kind of like look at that and think, where do I go from here? Now, um, there's a good couple of ways that we can go about finding the Cartesian equation for the locus that satisfies, locus I should say, that satisfies this um, equation we've got here, okay, in complex terms. I can convert this to something that's just x's and y's. I'm going to talk through method one, and then I'm going to actually do method two, all right? Method one is you can say, oh, I've, I've seen something like this before. Modulus equals modulus. I'm familiar with the kind of shape that should emerge from that. It's the one we did in the first example. This should be a perpendicular bisector, right? So when you then look at your Argan diagram, you can say this is the interval that I need to be perpendicular to. So therefore, if I just find this gradient, the perpendicular gradient to that will be the negative reciprocal, right? And then you can just find out whatever that is, you'll get a gradient. Um, then you also need to find out um, to bisect this, like I don't just want to be perpendicular anywhere, I've got to be perpendicular and through that spot right there, right? The midpoint. So if you can find the midpoint there, it's not too hard in this case, right? Find the midpoint, then you can just go from a gradient and a point, set of coordinates, you can just go point gradient form, and that'll be fine, okay? So that's great if you already know in advance what kind of shape this should provide for you, and you can say, I know the features that will define that. That's handy if you already know where you're going. But what if you do not, right? If you're like, if you meet some other thing that looks different, or you meet this thing and you're like, I cannot remember what kind of shape this is. A more general technique, it's because it's more general, it's slower, but it will work no matter what kind of shape you get, perpendicular bisector or otherwise. We're gonna tackle this algebraically. Now, um, I know Mrs. Lee's very purposely was avoiding doing this on um, Tuesday's lesson. And that's because, that's because, we want you to get a visual intuition for what's going on. That's much more powerful than just machining through the algebra. But sometimes, number one, when you don't have the visual intuition. Number two, when you're like, my points are icky. 
Like I need to do this precisely. The algebra is the tool that you have to go to. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We wanna get to a Cartesian equation. That's something not in terms of z's, it's in terms of x's and y's, okay? So therefore, I'm reintroducing rectangular form into this equation here because it's gonna be useful to me. Watch, if I just do a straight substitution, right? I'm gonna put that in for the first z, and then I've got it here again. X plus i, y, it's time for me to expand this term over here, okay? So I have this in here. Now, I've, I've made progress, I've got x's and y's, no more z's, but my Cartesian equation shouldn't have i's flying around in it, right? Like I should be able to um, write this in terms of just a, a two-dimensional um, relationship. So I, I somehow want to get rid of all these i's flying around, okay? Now, I want you to think back to how we defined the modulus of z. If you have some complex number z, and it's in um, rectangular form, how do you find its modulus? Do you remember? We, we had to use our old friend Pythagoras, right? It's the square root of? Yeah, our, our two horizontal and vertical coordinates, right? So x squared plus y squared in this case, right? So I can find, I can, you see how this gets rid of all of my i's and that kind of thing? This is a Cartesian relationship, right? So if I can do something like this here, then I'm, I'm good to go, okay? The only problem is, these guys here don't look like they're in rectangular form. I need to twist and turn these a little bit, okay? This one's not so hard, watch. What is the real component of, take a breath, x plus i, y plus i? Which part is the real part? It's just the x, isn't it? Everything else has an i attached to it. So that's not too hard, I'll just hang that out the front. Which is the imaginary component? Yeah, it's. It's i, y plus i, but normally in rectangular form, I factorize out my i, right? So I'll stay with red, factor out my i. Anyway, um, what am I going to get when I take out a factor of i? I get y plus well, 1 in this case, right? Because there's just one i hanging out there. Is that okay? So when I close this, you can see this is in rectangular form now. Real part, imaginary part, I could do this thing on it. Is that all right? What about the right hand side? Again, um, help me find the real and the imaginary components. Real first. What's real in here? The x is real and that minus 3, also real. So therefore, I'm going to group that out the front. I'll even put brackets around it just to make it super obvious. Real component. Uh, I'm going to start to factor out the i of the rest of it. What have I got here? It's similar but slightly different. Yeah, y minus one lot of i. So I get this factorization from those two terms. Okay. So now that I can close my modulus, I'm ready to go into this. Okay. But um, I mean, I'm going to get a square root on this side. I'm going to get a square root on that side. Gross. I don't want square roots. And I've got one on both sides. I might as well go one extra step and square both of them. Right. Do you see what I just did? I'm about to get a square root here and a square root here, which I need to get rid of. So I might as well take that step now and square both sides. Is that okay? All right, so let's do real component squared plus imaginary component squared. There's the real component squared. And then here comes the imaginary component squared. So far so good. What about over here? Real component squared imaginary component squared okay now this you see what I mean by this is a much longer way than just if I knew what this shape was I could just go straight to the relevant features midpoint gradient this is long however you must have some faith and I'm, I'm gonna invite you to do the algebra now right you must have some faith that all this complicated stuff will eventually marvelously cancel out maybe you're already starting to see the bits that are going to cancel so go ahead and do that and then Find for me a Cartesian equation. If you already got it, call me over. I just want to have a quick look. All right, so um, I saw some promising signs. Maybe you got there. I've just put in my immediate next line. And even though this does look like it's going to be an unmitigated disaster, I would call it a mitigated disaster. Because even though you have a lot of terms here, it's just cancel land everywhere, isn't it? Because you've got these x squared terms. They're gone. Um, you've got these y squared terms, they're gone. You even for free, you get these plus ones <laughs> because of the symmetry of this, they're gone. So therefore you end up getting, uh, I only have a 2y left over here and I've got a, mm, just checking that I've, um, oh sorry, I take it back. I've got a, I'm gonna add 2y to both sides so I get 4y, 
over here. I might as well write that. Uh, and then I'm getting this on the right hand side. Yeah? Um, you could make this in general form, or you could divide through at this point to put it into slope intercept form. So you might have this as your final line. Were you okay with that? Did you arrive? And so you're like, oh, no wonder. No wonder I could not simply eyeball that, because I don't really have a good enough scale to say, oh, that must be 9 on 4. Of course, right? Um, and then your x-intercept will be 3 over 2 as well, and you're fine. OK, does that make sense? Now, I got a good question from, um, from Manuel just now about, like, see, see this dotted line in here, the interval between my two, I call them my, um, my reference points, right? Um, do I need to put those two in, uh, sorry, that, that interval in? The short answer is, you put it in if it is required as part of your working for where you got this line from. Okay, let me explain to you why it would be necessary or why it wouldn't. This interval is important if I look at this equation and I say perpendicular bisector. Therefore, I'm going to start to find the point that it goes through and the gradient, right? If you are coming from the point of logic that this must be a perpendicular bisector, then it rather matters to me that the thing you are perpendicular to and the thing you are bisecting is on your diagram. Like that needs to be there if you want to make that argument. Have a look at this, this mess of working over here, right? Not an efficient way to go about it, but it got us the equation. Did I ever have to rely on my knowledge of it being a perpendicular bisector at any point during this working? Never, right? Like this interval didn't even come into my reasoning. So therefore, if this was the way I went about it, I could just go straight to doing the line and I would be fine because this is my working, not a, a geometric argument. Is that okay? Algebraic argument, geometric argument. 